welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. This is episode 180. It is Saturday, December 12th, and I want to welcome you to this place. Welcome to new viewers and welcome to returning viewers. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you watching this show and coming to check it out and check out what we do here week in, week out at Woolen Spinning. Welcome to new patrons of the show over the last couple of weeks. Welcome to this place, and I hope that you're navigating everything well. If you're having trouble navigating or you haven't found the Woolen Spinning Index just yet, please check the show notes or reach out to myself. Uh, and welcome to patrons. Thank you so much uh, for being here, you guys. I really appreciate it. We do the live stream every Saturday morning for patrons of the community, and then the show is released publicly on Tuesday afternoons, Pacific Standard Time. So the chat is already up, up and running, and I just want to thank everybody for welcoming one another and for being here. Um, for some of you, I wanted to remind you, I haven't said this for a really super long time. Uh, for some of you who your username and your Ravelry name and your Slack ID and everything doesn't match your first name, um, when you say hello, um, make sure you say who you are and what your first name is, because sometimes people know don't know who you are until you say who you are what your first name is. Um, so welcome everybody. We've got Maggie and Zan and Carol and Judy and Loreline. Uh, Martha was here. We were chatting earlier. Lauren, Tessa, Dagmar. It's really good to see everyone. Eve is here. Thank you so much, you guys, for being here. In today's show, I have a huge finished object and I have a smaller finished object. I have actually been getting a lot done. Uh, the reason is because, well, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. I've been getting a lot done on one hand, and then on the other hand, I've been getting nothing done. Um, I'm very far behind on my spinning advent calendar, which is actually kind of a bummer because I was doing really super well for the first week. And then this week, I sort of got derailed. So I'm trying to play catch up and get up to date. And I did a little bit of swatching this week and was just playing around because I just needed something that was sort of creatively uh, stimulating, if you will. I have decided to put some of my projects on hold until the new year or until some other stuff is done. So I was working on my poet sweater this week and it was it's going really well. I put a really good couple of inches onto it and um, I was really, really um, enjoying pulling it back out again and getting going on the lace again because I'm at that point where I've separated for the body, I've separated for the sleeves and I'm, ju I'm just working on the body and it's just straight following the the chart, you know, around and around and around. And the chart is quite extensive. And so I think I only have to do the chart like five times or something like that for the body, maybe a few more. But it's not something that I can really wear right now because we have a heavy frost on the ground this morning, which is lovely. And it's nice and cool out. It's crispy. And I've been wearing my heavy woolly sweaters and long sleeve t-shirts underneath. So I thought, you know, there's really no rush to get this done. And my little love sweater that I talked about a little while ago. It's one of those patterns where I have to sit there and look at the look at the pattern and and go row by row. And I'm still kind of working on the yoke part. So I'm not into that part yet where you're just sailing along with the body or the sleeves. So I put it aside and I just sort of took the pressure off with both of those items and I decided to work on some other stuff and just focus on some other things to feel like not only I'm getting some things done but also just um working on some things that are sort of festive and sort of timely for this time of year because I usually don't do that around Christmas time and uh, I thought this year we're home anyways we're not doing a lot of family stuff obviously we're not traveling we're not going out to things and I just kind of thought you know maybe this is the year to focus on working on some stuff for me so and I still have those dish towels that I'm working on the uh, the dish cloths sorry not dish towels the dish cloth I finished off the first four which I showed you guys for one gift and I have another four they're still on the loom but they're finished um, and those are for some other gifts that I will finish off this week I'm actually hoping to work on them a little bit today and those will get wound off like to, I'll pull them off the loom wash them up hem them I just have to cut them and, and cut all the little bits because I hem stitched them if you're wondering what I'm talking about, I, I showed them and talked about them on the podcast, maybe not last episode, but the episode before. And those are coming along. I'm still having a bit of issues with the tensioning on the rigid heddle, but it's actually getting better. Um, I think because the 
back beam is getting lighter. There's not as much warp on it and uh, because some of that's moving to the front beam. So that's it. I have been working on, oh, Diana, that's so funny. I was just going to say the Long Way Homestead. I have been working on the Rambouillet. So I've still, I've got it back behind me, but we've been rearranging our house quite a lot and moving around furniture. And Diana says it's bouncy and soft. So her, there's a bunch of us that are part of the Long Way Homestead Fiber Club. And it's a breed study basically that gets sent out every month. It's very, um, the, the fiber prep is unbelievable. And the one for November was Rambouillet. And um, I, we've been moving furniture around and I moved one of our chairs upstairs to our room because our master bedroom is ridiculously big for the size of our house. And I've kind of created a little spinning nook up there for in the evenings because sometimes I don't feel like knitting, but we're not quite ready to go to bed. And so I've been working on it on my Lendrum. So um, that's so wonderful, Diana, because actually I was going to do the same thing. I was going to divide it in, t in half and do uh, 50 grams to each bobbin and spin a two-ply. Oh, and Sarah's working on knitting up her Breed and Color yarn. I can't wait to see that. And oh, well, good morning, Rebecca. Keeping you company this morning while wrapping hand-woven scarves in handmade wrapping paper. That's wonderful. I totally agree, Diana. Having a spinning nook is absolutely divine. Um, so in the show today, I've got, like I said, I've got a big, big uh, finished item. For those who are wondering about all the things that are happening in our community and all the things that go on here, please have a look at the show notes. Patreon.com slash Welford Pearls, and this is episode 180, or you can go over to the blog, WelfordPearls.com. And if you're over on the blog, you can hit subscribe to the newsletter. It comes out once a month. We've got an issue coming out on Monday. And that helps you keep up to date with things that are going on around here in the community. So uh, in January and February, we've got uh, the um, the beginning sort of overarching theme for the year, which is luxury and luxury fibers. What is luxury? What is luxury fibers? Why do we put these fibers up on a pedestal and stash them and not spin them? Um, that'll be the conversation that we'll be having all year uh, or, you know, at least until the end of the summer. And we'll be starting off with silk, including mulberry and wild silks at the beginning of the year. So I hope that you guys will be joining us for that conversation. Um, so it looks like people are weaving, people are drinking coffee this morning. Um, some people are working on their spinning advent calendars. I'm terribly behind, like I said. So <laughs> we can only do so much. We can only do so much. So let's get into the show. Oh my goodness, I was just reading Kim's comment. It made me laugh. I'm sorry, Kim. I am so sympathetic. I was just having this exact same conversation with Katrina this week. Uh, she's knitting the wheat scarf from Tin Can Knits out of Malamute hair that she spun for a customer. And she keeps thinking to herself, why do I agree to knit gifts in December for custom orders? Oh my goodness, Kim, I'm so sympathetic. Um, I decided this year that I was not going to do any high pressure knitting or high pressure weaving. And there's a couple of things that I would love to do if I get time just for us and for myself, but, or like for our family. Um, but I just refused to do anything that wasn't, uh, that wasn't already done. And the last thing was these dishcloths. And my plan was to have them done by the end of December, by the end of November, but I just ran out of time. But I, you know, why do we put so much pressure on ourselves at this time of year? We do it year after year after year. And of course there's, you know, uh, businesses that we're running and, you know, orders that we're taking. And so I'm really, really sympathetic. Like business doesn't stop at this time of year, but, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, it, it, we, ha we, um, we have to be kind to ourselves. So. Why don't we start off with my spinning advent calendar because I did get some yarns finished last night. Sorry about that. Um, we were watching a movie last night with the kids and it was actually quite entertaining. I was surprised at, at how much um, we all we all enjoyed it actually. And um, 
I've been making really good progress on these. So um, I've, I'm, I'm behind, like I said, let me just turn the camera ever so slightly. Um, we, I am behind, like I said, but, um, I, I'm, I'm catching up slowly, but surely I am catching up. So this is the first, that's not too bad. You know, like they're both, they're all half an ounce. Um, and, uh, this was day one. Day one, day two, day three, gets a bit fuzzy after that. Day four, day five, day six, day seven, I think. I might be wrong. And I have to go back and watch all of the advent vlogs, which I will link in the show notes. I've been doing a, an, a, an advent vlog every day for the month of December. And um, they've actually been really fun to do. And I'll just move this out of the way for you guys. Um, the uh, it's really kept me on track actually with this. I, I'm, I'm glad that I started it and that it was an idea that I had this year because it's, it, it really has kept me on track. So all of these I've been spinning, um, long draw, um, I've been spinning off of a distaff. If you are curious about that spinning and want to see me doing that, please look for the playlist. Uh, I will take a moment and I will link the playlist in the um, live chat so that you guys can access that. If you haven't seen it yet, I've been adding all of the vlogs to the, uh, playlist as on YouTube, as I've been making them so that you guys can go back for, if you miss a bunch or if you miss one or you're behind or whatever, or you want to see them and you haven't seen them yet. Um, there is video of me, me spinning, loading the disc staff and then spinning off the disc staff. Um, these are all being spun now on my Magic Craft Susie. And the reason for that is because I can just go a little bit faster. And I've been spinning to, uh, one out, um, each color. I've been spinning over top of each other on a bobbin. So last night I applied these two and, um, it's been going quite well, uh, by doing that. So I think this is the order. I think that's the order so far. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Cause this one, yeah. Cause this one I, I didn't end up doing I did this one. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that's the order so far. So that's December 1st, all the way through to December 7th. And, um, I have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 to do <laughs> eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. I've only got, I've got five to do four. Anyhow, I'm behind. <laughs> so I will get, I will get caught up at some point. Yeah, the peachy coral, that was the day one. That was, it's really pretty. Um, if you're into those colors, the theme of the spinning advent calendar for King, this is from Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks. And Liz's theme was Caribbean sunsets, I think, or Caribbean. And um, the, uh, I got the one with sparkle. So it's Columbia Dorset with 10% sparkle. I think it 10% 10, 10 sparkle. I think it's, I think that's what it is. So. Yeah. Yes, that's true, Eve. So, um, Eve said she's noticed that the length of my spinning when I'm, when I'm spinning long draw, um, with the distaff, it's shorter than without. So when I don't spin with the distaff, my length of draft is a lot longer. And that's actually one of the reasons why I really like spinning with the distaff is because, um, it keeps my length of draft a lot shorter. It, I don't end up going way out like this. I, I, um, it definitely keeps me, uh, more kind of confined so that I'm kind of more like this and I, I come out like this and, and come on instead of, um, being way up and out because that I find with long draw, I kind of forget that I have to wind my singles onto the wheel because I get so into focusing on what I'm doing because I, you get into such a lovely rhythm with long draw and, um, with the disc staff holding it, um, in my hand, cause I've been playing with different ways of spinning with it. So, um, I know you guys want to hear all about it. Thank you. For, thank you, Zen for asking. Um, I sort of need a chance to keep playing with it for a bit longer and sort of get my head around what, what works for me and what doesn't and what I can show you because I've really found that, um, I really, <sighs> 
I'm really enjoying just playing with different ways of using them. Uh, my friend Kim lent me five different types of distaffs, distapes. So I have been kind of using a different one every day. So I haven't actually stopped using the finger hole one. I just have been rotating through and I haven't gotten back to that one yet. So, um, I actually really liked that one. So interestingly, so with the ring distaves, they have a hole at the bottom and what I and they were a little bit smaller. So it's all of the ones that that I've been borrowing from Kim are very light. What I really liked about the ring one was instead of holding it in my pinky, I ended up moving it to my ring finger on my right hand, so my fiber supply hand. And I found I could actually kind of just like flick it around and move it around. I don't know if I have it right here. To be able to show you, I do, I do have it right here. Sorry for the pause. Let me put the bigger camera on and you guys can see what I mean. So what I've been doing is holding it in my fiber supply hand. And instead of holding it in my, on my pinky, because I found that this kind of sounds funny, but when it was on my pinky, I found it was like too far away. I know that seems a bit odd, but it felt like I had to keep like moving my hand around. So with this particular distaff, if I put it in my ring finger, it moved it closer to my front two fingers and I felt like I had more control. I felt like it was just closer because you're holding onto it here. And so I felt like as I was spinning that I was able to handle it a little bit better by moving it up. I even played with putting it into my middle finger um, but that was too close. I didn't have enough uh, dexterity in my pointer finger and my thumb to be able to uh, still draft off of it. I found my ring finger really worked well. So, and the other thing, somebody had commented um, that um, they had commented that um, they'd never thought about using a distaff on a spinning wheel. And that prompted sort of a, a little bit of a conversation because the thing is these tools were developed before spinning wheels were a thing, right? Um, and so we forget that these are these are just tools. And that was one of the things in Stephanie um, Gustad's book that really reminded me of like these tools are, are just that, they're tools. And it's up to us to use them in different ways and to apply them in different in different um ways and to experiment and to sort of take on the spirit of curiosity and the spirit of experimentation, which we've talked a lot about in our community. So when I've been playing with all the different distaves that Kim lent me, um, that's been a real, um, a really good reminder to, to sort of slow down and think of it as, as a tool to create really great yarn rather than, um, a, a you know, a, something that's cumbersome or getting in the way or uh, a new thing that I have to wrap my head around or anything like that, or that I can't use it with this thing, but I can use it with this thing. Just kind of exploring it and just seeing like, maybe, maybe this won't work. Like maybe I won't like spinning off of a distaff at all. Um, and I'll abandon it after a little while. And I'll just say, Hey, I tried it. I gave a, a really good earnest try. Um, what I do like about these different types of distaves that Kim has, uh, lent me is the opportunity to try different things. So one of the things has been putting it in a basket next to me so that it's not actually being held in my hand. Um, that's been kind of fun to play with. Um, another time I actually put it in my, in my belt, um, and was spinning off of it like this, oh, one of the bigger ones. Um, that was kind of fun to play with. Um, and I thought that I would find it really annoying sitting on my chair with something like in my belt like this, but it actually, it actually was totally fine. Um, and then I, but my favorite way thus far has been to actually hold it. Um, and no, I don't find them heavy and no, my wrist doesn't get tired. Um, so yeah, that's been, uh, um, really interesting. According to your speediest yarn vlog, you should be able to spin all that in an Aaron. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Rebecca. Um, I just want to catch up with, with chat because you guys have been chatting. Um, oh no, Charlotte. Um, yeah, thanks, Dan. I, I know you didn't mean right now. We always end up getting into these, um, uh, uh, um, rabbit holes with the podcast, but that's, I mean, that's why we all love to, uh, why we love to, um, do this, right? Um, 
Oh, thank you, uh, Diana. Yes, Kim had Kim. I've seen Kim's, and we I I haven't played with it, but um, I've seen hers. If you wouldn't mind, that would be wonderful, Diana. Thank you, because um, I wonder if Mike could uh, mimic it and model it and make one um, by looking at by looking at the one that Andrew did. Um, so I notice I'm changing that. Yeah. So Pat, um, notice that you're changing the pronunciation of distaff. Are there two different words? So I always get comments on the podcast about the pronunciation of distaff and distaves, and I always end up getting a bit tongue tied with them. So a distaff is the single distaff, multiple distaffs. That's not a word. It's multiple distaves, S-T-A-V-E-S. So I always get, um, um, comments about, you know, distaff versus distaves. It's because it's two different words. One is plural, one is singular. So I hope that helps to clarify that. It would be interesting to see. Yeah, so Linnea, I will absolutely show them the ones that I've borrowed from my friend Kim. Um, there, there, there's a whole bunch of different ones. And um, yes, absolutely, I will, I will share that with you guys for sure. Yes, exactly, Charlotte, half and halves, exactly. The plural is distaves. English is weird. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. You're absolutely right. English is weird. Um, I just want to catch up because you guys are um, um, have some really great things. So it looks like uh, I think I okay. Wonderful. Distaff distaves. You guys are clarifying. So wonderful. I don't want to move on to the conversation unless there's more questions. So I always like to slow down and have a look at the chat because sometimes um, things get missed. Oh, hi, Kelly. Good morning. Good to see you. So that's the ring distaff. And I have been playing around with all of them. I haven't played around with two of the five that Kim had lent me. And I would really like to play around with one on my wheel. So that is something like where it's actually loaded to the wheel. So that is something that... Um, that I would like to look at for sure. So thank you, Diana. So that's my spinning advent calendar. And if you're interested to see me actually spinning at the wheel and working on it, uh, please have a look at the vlogs. They've been a lot of fun to make. I've really enjoyed them. And um, uh, it's it's been kind of a, a daily... Um, um, I guess, challenge, if you will, um, to get them out and to do them. And of course, last weekend, it all fell apart because I was working, but that's okay. Life, right? I, I have been working on little ornaments. I just finished this one. I wanted to show it to you guys. Uh, this is a free pattern. Um, let me just move this. Sorry, I've got all these things on my counter. Um, this is, oh, what's it called? Mini Christmas. It's a free pattern. Uh, mini Christmas stockings. They're ornaments. This is the pattern here. It's by Little Cotton Rabbits. I've been making a couple of these every year. And then I kind of get sidetracked and I stop making them. And then I, you know, pull, pull the pattern back out and I think, oh, I should get going with that. And then I don't. Anyways, this year I was like, you know what? There's no excuse. I have all of the yarn. It's still in, in a bag uh, ready to be knit up. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to put pressure on myself to make 25. I'm just going to make a few. And, you know, maybe I can make a few every month for the next few months. And maybe eventually I'll have my 25 that I would like to have. So there's a whole bunch of color work patterns that you can do. And you can do plain, you can do striped. Um, and then, of course, you can do um, one of these. So I did the tree pattern this past week. And I needed something to work on at my mom's house that was kind of mindless. And I was able to just whip this little guy off. And then you seam up the back. You knit it on straight needles. I did it on circulars, but straight, um, not in the round. You can do them in the round. I have done them in the round. I don't think they look as good when they're knit in the round for some reason. They're just too small. Um, I think they actually have better form and look better, and the heel turns out a bit better if you knit them uh, the way the pattern tells you to. And then you sew a little a little button on the back to hold the little hanging tie. So it's just, it's not, it's not hand spun, but it's just a really cute idea. And I've been collecting little tiny buttons out of my stash. Um, you know, how would you get sweaters when you buy a sweater? None of us buy sweaters probably anymore, but you'd always get like the little Ziploc bag with the spare button in it. I always keep those. And so I've been putting them in here and saving them so that I have them for the back of the stockings. So I've been saving these for years and I thought, you know what, I need to start actually like making these and actually like doing this. So I got, I've, I've done two so far this year and um, 
hopefully I can, I can do a couple more, um, at some point. So, oh, thank you, Diana. I really appreciate it, Diana. Would love to try distaff at some point, point, but I mostly spin from card to Rolex. So that um, is really interesting, Janine, that you would say that because we were. This is where the conversation actually came from uh, in the virtual spin group about distaves. Was that I think it was Laura Line had was working on the breeding color study, and she had taken the Rolex, one of them, and of course those Rolex for the breeding color study, um, you know, they can be quite quite hefty uh, if you're working with quite a bit of yarn. I can't. I think Laura Line had made them. And, but she had pre-drafted it all out. And so she had this huge length of fiber, of pre-drafted, pre-attenuated fiber. And we were talking in the virtual spin group about how to keep that all nicely organized. And that was where the conversation with the disc staves came up. And her and I, and we were all sort of saying like, this is why we need stuff like this and why we need basically like a fiber management tool, <laughs> which is what Stephanie Gustad calls it in the book, is a, is a fiber management tool, something to keep our fibers organized and to keep them from, you know, getting eaten by the cat and from just rolling across the room, which is usually what happens to me in all honesty. And I have really, really um, had to, I, it's been really liberating to have a fiber management tool that I can load on all that fiber and it's right there. And wool is so light that um, you it's not heavy. And you can put it down. You can put it in other things like your belt or a basket or a stool with a hole in the middle. There's pictures of that in uh, Stephanie's uh, book. Oh, that's right, Laureline. It was Rolex from Katrina, but not the actual breeding color study. That's right. Yeah, exactly, Eve. Um, covered in dog hair. Yeah. Um, you know, your fiber falls on the floor and then it, all of a sudden, you you know, next thing you know, it's covered in dog hair. I finished a non spinning advent spin this week. This is UK Shetland. Uh, this is from Small Bird Workshop. This is the fiber that I was spinning on my Lendrum Saxony that I was talking about on the show that I was having a little bit of difficulty with. I have not washed this. I applied it last night. Um, it's as you can see, so I spun it long draw. It was from a pin drafted roving, but there was just tons and tons of shortcuts and short bits and um, neps and, you know, tips that weren't home pinned and stuff in the roving. The yarn has actually come out quite nicely and I'm going to wash it this week to today. Actually, I'll, I'll pop it into some water and wash it. I don't think that I'll full it. I'll just put it in some really, really super hot water and um, mush it around a little bit. I got quite good yardage. I'm not sure exactly how much yardage is here, but I, I it, it's quite a it's quite a hefty skein. I'll open it up for you guys. There's still some dust and dirt coming off of it, so it definitely needs to be washed in um, more than just a eucalyn or a soak. Um, I think I'm going to put it into. Um, I've got some unicorn power scour. I'll just put a little bit into the wash water and see if I can get this a little bit cleaner. Um, but the finished yarn came out really nicely. I'm sure that there's about 400 yards here. And um, it'll be enough for for something pretty, you know, as an as an accent yarn or a background yarn. I actually wondered about putting it with um, my evil eye for my evil eye cowl, cowl but it's a little bit. Uh, this is quite a bit cooler in tone. This is a little bit warmer. This is, it's not quite as cool. So this is uh, going to be washed this week. It twists back on itself two times I think when I pulled it off the wheel it twisted back now it's kind of lost some of its twist because it's been sitting in a skein but it twisted a good two times and I was happy with the twist angle and you can see in here there's some curly cues um, where the twist will dissipate and let go but you can see there's all of this stuff in this yarn and it's all going to lift off over time and it's all going to come out but in the meantime it's going to look neppy um, when you first knit with it so um, we will see what this ends up being. I think it, uh, to be totally honest, it's probably going to go in the stash for now, but overall pretty happy with it. I still, I, I spent on my Lendrum Saxony at 18 to one in double drive. It was, it, that was just absolutely beautiful. That worked out really beautifully. I loved spinning it, um, on there. And I have some other pin drafted roving and whatnot that I think I'm going to throw on my Lendrum Saxony next as well and um 
I'm actually thinking about starting my natural shades along sweater because that's going to be one of my main projects for all year next year. There's no no timeline other than getting it done within the year time frame. So uh, that is going to be my next project. So I need to figure out exactly which five colors of natural shades I'm going to do because I'm hoping to do the Grey Roop sweater by Camilla Vlad. Camilla Vlad. I will link to it in the show notes for you guys, but this is a project that I is part of our natural shades along Camilla Vad, and I'm going to be working on this sort of throughout next year. There's no rush, but I need five colors, uh, a gray, a black, a cream, a light brown, and a another light brown. So um, uh, Liz of Kingdom Fleece and Fiber Works is helping me out with one of the colors. I have the other two colors in my stash. I have tons of white or cream, and then we'll go from there and see what else I need to add. I may need a darker one, but I think I have a one that's dark enough in my stash. And I'm always curious. I have to admit, I've been kind of waiting to see what Longway Homestead is sending for December and January and maybe even February to see if maybe that will be the fifth color. Um, because I'm thinking that that will, will be a nice, a nice mix. So that is that yarn. Uh, Eve had a great question. It's quite low twist. Um... Yeah, it's probably about 30 degrees for the twist angle. Um, I didn't put a ton of twist into it. It's I wanted it to be a, a really nice woolen yarn. So and if I put it in really super hot water, that will be uh, that will be enough to hold it all together. So I'm um, yeah, it's not not high twist for sure. Yeah, great question, Eve. I finished something. <laughs> so this is the headband with a twist by Morella Moments. This is for my mom for Christmas. And uh, I'll just put it on for you guys. Um, I knit this on slightly bigger needles than my other one. So this one I did on four millimeter needles instead of the called for, is it 3.5 millimeter needles in the pattern? And um, this is my hand spun. It's ancient uh, Sweet Georgia. And this is Panda, Sweet Georgia Panda. It doesn't have a colorway name. This was just something in my stash that I had spun back in 2014. And uh, it was seconds um, in a, um, a bin at, at the studio way back, way back then. And I spun it all different ways. I was playing around with it. Originally, I was hoping to make some socks out of it. I never did. It's been in my stash ever since. And there was three skeins, one that was chain plied, one that was two plied, and one that was a traditional three ply, which I think was the original skein. And the two ply and the chain plied ones ended up going into the into the headband. So I um, the two ply, I ended up holding double. So half of this is the two ply held double, and part of this is the chain ply. Uh, because if I held the two ply double, it matched the chain ply and gauge because my spinning was very uneven in this, all of this. And um, it, I think it actually turned out really well. I really, really like it. I actually am kind of sad to see it go. <laughs> but my mom hopefully will wear it and enjoy it. And um, it turned out really nicely. And then I thought I would show you a little, show it to you up close. So this is what the twist looks like up here. It's just brioche. It's super easy. It's a free pattern. Um, you knit for 18 or 19 inches and then you cast off loosely. There is a line where the chain ply starts, but thankfully when you're wearing it, you can't really see that. And uh, this is the two ply held double. This is that side. And then you seam it up and you hold the four, the four together and you seam it up and then turn it turn it right side out. It's all on the vlog um, for, was it Thursday's vlog, I think, that this was in and I showed some seaming. So yeah, super easy headband pattern. Oh my goodness, it's so, so, so simple. And uh, it turned out really, really well. So on Thursday, I had to go into work and uh, I had my, my uh, re- certification for my my BLS and I had been playing around with some swatching in the evening with this Cumbria imitation yarn that I had worked on back in the fall and um, this got stashed and there's about 500 yards of it and I really was hoping that I could put it with my kinfolk 
yarn and do something with them and maybe just spin more of the Cumbria. Anyways, I swatched it up and the pattern that I was trying to match gauge for, I wasn't even close. And unfortunately, the, the differences in gauge was actually, as I was knitting, was actually quite uh, remarkable. Um, the, the, the organic pole worth was, it's very, very tightly spun. So once it was washed and dried, the swatch really, that yarn really poofed up, but it didn't really work with the Cumbria. They're just really, really, really different yarns. So the Cumbria imitation is 60% BFL, 30% Massam, and then 10% mohair. So it's a very like drapey, um, fuzzy, what I would call like a real long wool yarn. Um, it's got a, a, a lovely drape, but it's totally different from the Targi, or sorry, from the, uh, from the Polworth. And in the swatch, I didn't really think that it really worked really super well. I didn't think that the yarns really matched very nicely, uh, even though they're both two ply. I think you could, you could probably get away with it if you really wanted to, and if your heart was absolutely set on using these two yarns together, it would be, it would be fine. But I just, I didn't love it and I didn't have to put them together. And so I thought, you know, this is great. I've got gauge. Um, now I know the gauge of, of the Cumbria yarn. And um, this was knit on 3.5 millimeter needles. It's a little bit, a little bit tight for the Cumbria. I could feel, I could feel the sort of the firmness of the knitting. And this yarn had swatched up really, really beautifully on four millimeter needles. So I put it aside and um, I put this aside. And as I was thinking about it throughout the day and I was working on, oh, sorry, I kicked the camera. Um, and as I was working on my evil eye cowl, which is out of Mina Phillips book, Cowls, I've made really some really actually quite good progress. I'm about eight inches in and I need to knit about nine inches. Um, it's just really pretty you know it's self-striping a little bit it's very hand spunny looking the the crepe yarn is is knitting up really really beautifully it's got a lovely drape um it's super wash merino i think is this yarn i know it's super wash um so it's got a nice drape it's got a nice sheen to it it's just very very simple and it's the same gauge as the cumbria so my contrast yarn is going to be the cumbria and I thought that that would work really quite nicely. And then I don't have to buy yarn. I can use some of my stash yarn and learn what I need to learn and what I want to learn. I need about 500 yards of this, which is what I spun. And I thought they would really work well together. So I'm gonna sort of, you know, knit the last little, I've got one more inch of straight stockinette to, to knit on this. And, uh, and then I'll be able to start the color work. And it's an evil eye. Uh, color work pattern that will be worked throughout the the tubular cowl. It's a tubular cowl So you are supposed to do a provisional cast on but I could not find a crochet hook for the life of me so I just did a, a Conventional cast on and I'll just seam it and then you knit for a certain amount a, a, I think it's like 10 inches or 9 inches or something and then you start the uh, chart pattern So I'm excited to actually start the color work part because that's the part of course that is so exciting so this will be my um, basic life support is BLS. So um, this will be my sort of Christmas project going sort of for the rest of the month. And that's what I meant at the beginning of the show about sort of putting some of these other projects aside for a little bit and just enjoying some of this holiday knitting for the next couple of weeks. Oh, do you, Alberto? So she has to do her BLS research by next month. Good luck. Yeah, we have to do ours yearly. The Canadian Heart and Stroke Association wants um, uh, people to research it every year because uh, basically once you leave the class, within just when they've done studies, within just a couple of hours, people have forgotten what was taught. And of course, you guys can, can probably appreciate we use it all the time. So uh, our BLS, we really need to have like that on the tip of our fingers. I can't remember, but I think, so I have had BLS certification since I was 14. So I have been certified in BLS and advanced life support for coming up, well, 14, 20, 24 years, almost 25 years. It's pretty cool. So, um, 
And actually it was funny because he did a poll that the, I know the instructor really, really well. He did a poll of everybody that was there because it was mostly critical care staff that was present in the recertification. And uh, so a combination of eMERGE, eMERGE staff, cardiac nurses and um, ICU nurses. And it was interesting because he asked if anybody present had ever done CPR before. And it was interesting because only about half of us put up our hands um, and the other half hadn't hadn't had the pleasure yet of doing it. So it was uh, it really um, it kind of re re uh, reminded me, actually, that, you know, we need this stuff like this, but we don't necessarily use it all the time. So and of course, it's an ICU nurse. You're not necessarily doing CPR because you're doing other things. So anyhow, sidetrack. So. Um, I got really sidetracked this week. <laughs> so when I talk about holiday knits, this is what I'm talking about. The evil eye cowl and this. So Isabel Kramer published a pattern called Jingle um, this month and I missed the discount code for it. Um, I should have just put in the bullet and bought it for the discount, but I also really don't mind supporting her because I think she's a really great pattern designer and I really like her patterns and I don't mind paying for them because um, there's value there in, in what she does. So I took the, I couldn't, after I did that, this swatch with the Cumbria and it, it just didn't really work. I couldn't stop thinking about uh, working with this yarn. Um, and I think part of it is I just, I really love these colors. I think they're just really fantastic. And I love how the skein moves. And so I called Katrina and I was like, I have a yarn SOS. And, uh, of course she was there for me, uh, cause that's what, that's what close friends do. And so this is, uh, her tough and tender, um, in the fingering weight in the O natural colorway. So I got three of these. I think I'll only need three according to the yardage in the pattern for the main color. I only need three. This is knit on 3.5 millimeter needles. Um, and I, you do the cast on, on smaller needles. Um, so I, uh, did that. And this is called Jingle. So the, it's when you look at the pattern online, uh, it doesn't overtly scream at you um, bobbles. But when you look at the color work chart, that's what it is. It's bobbles that come down into the yoke. So I'll show this to you up close because I just, part of the reason why I'm so far along already is because I can't stop knitting. <laughs> look at these colors. Look at that. And this is a much, much better pairing of commercial yarn with hand spun. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So this is the beginning half. I'm halfway through of the chart. And um, you do a long tail cast on and then you do a couple of rows. She tells you exactly what to do. You do some short rows at the back neck. Oh, shoot. I'm pulling stitches off. Hang on. We have a yarn SOS. Um, actually, you know what? Oh, I don't have them close by. Normally I, when I, I have, um, um, thingies that I put on the end anyhow. Um, and then you do short rows for the back neck. So this is the front and actually I don't have a cable extender. Otherwise I would put it on my dress form for you guys, but this is the front. And then at the back you work short rows, um, to lift up the back neck. So that's really nicely done there. And you do some increasing as well. Um, there was a, for the testers of the pattern, uh, I think it was size three to size 10, but I might be wrong. Um, there was some uh, feedback from the testers that the neckline was too big and that it was too um, boat neck and that they would appreciate a, a smaller option. Uh, that's not... Uh, the case for this size. So I'm knitting the, um, how many sizes are there? Isabel's patterns are usually pretty size inclusive. Um, it goes from a three, 35.25 inch bust. So basically 35 inches up to a 63.25 inch bust. Um, and then there, so there's uh, basically 10 sizes, 11 sizes from 35 inches up to 63. Uh, so what, um, and this is a schematic of, of the pattern. Isn't that beautiful? I love her drawings. I don't know if that's her drawing, but, um, if it is, I really love them. So the pattern calls for two contrast colors. 
So this is where a little bit of sleuthing came in. So because I was driving past Katrina's house on Thursday, because I was going to work anyways, which is why I told you about BLS, um, I asked her if I could stop by and get the yarn. So she left it in a bag at the front door for me and I had something to return to her anyways. So that worked out really well. Um, and I was able to get the yarn and I was able to cast on. The thing is, is that the, for the contrast color, you're supposed to have two contrast colors so that as you work your way down the chart in here, you're supposed to have a second color. So I went sleuthing on people's project pages in Ravelry, which is one of the reasons why I love Ravelry so much is for that reason, um, which is, um, yeah. So the, um, what a lot of people had done was actually skipped that and they'd only used one contrast color. Um, and they had just knit the whole thing as if they only had one color. And so that's, and it looked, awesome. Um, the second contrast color in most of the yolks gets lost anyways. And so I decided in mine that because I wanted to use this hand spun that was gradating through these colors, which is working up absolutely beautifully, if I do say so myself, um, I would just skip the second contrast color because I don't need it. So the in here in the middle of this bobble right here where my thumb is, you're supposed to have a second color, but of course I don't need it. So it ended up coming out this gorgeous, gorgeous red that Kylan uh, dyed. This is Kinfolk, Kinfolk um, fiber. So, yeah. So thank you so much. I have made a lot of progress. I cast on on Thursday night and I, I'm obsessed. <laughs> I've got more spinning done. <laughs> That's why I'm so far behind on my spinning advent calendar. So, yeah, it's working up really, really beautifully. And um, the... Uh, the, the thing about this type of spinning is I took the braid and I split it very, very minimally and I just spun end to end to make sure that I would get those long, slow transitions of color. And my, my sort of hope was that I would end up with a really great yarn for a colored yoke like this. So it, when Isabel Pope, you know, released this, um, pattern I just I kept coming back to it again and again and again because I just was like it's so perfect for my vision of what I thought um I would do with this yarn obviously it's not going to use very much of this yarn which is really great because then I can do something else so yeah just going to catch up really quickly on um the chat um thank you so much you guys for your compliments and you guys are chatting about the other things um, so that is what I have been working on. And those are all of my yarns and my projects. So let me show you the elephant in the room. My tunic cardigan is done. So I am going to turn the camera around just a little bit. So just give me a quick second here to do that so that I can share with you. This project, sorry for the silence for a minute. I was, I'm very focused. <laughs> So let me share this with you. Um, this is the tunic cardigan by Joan Cordioni. Um, she, if I move it up, you guys won't be able to see it, but you can see me chatting. So I will kind of get out of the way and let it do the most of the talking. Um, I had a lot of trouble getting buttons for this. So one of the things about sweater knitting versus um, knitting for or sewing garments is that when you're doing big buttons like this, uh, these are 35 millimeter buttons. And the, the pattern I think calls for 40 millimeter or I'm not totally sure. But basically, I ended up getting 40 millimeter or 45 millimeter at my local yarn shop. That was the sort of the biggest of the smallest, the smallest of the big buttons that they had. But they're 100% nylon, so they're very, very heavy. And so as soon as I put them on, they were hanging off of the sweater because they're really meant for more like heavy coats or jackets, you know, that you sew. And um, I needed lighter plastic buttons. So I did get to uh, my one of the uh, sewing stores here locally this week. And I was able to find the, these were the only big buttons they had because I was really hoping for gray buttons. The gray buttons really looked the best, but they didn't have any that were big enough. So I'm just going to keep my eyes open and, and like keep checking. Uh, but the buttonholes are quite significant. They're quite a good size. I tried a different, a few different buttonholes on this sweater 
but no matter what I did, um, the problem is that to get a hole, a hole big enough, um, you really need to make a big hole in your knitting. And so what you end up doing is um, leaving these stitches here and knitting back and forth for a few rows. And then you do the next one and then the next one. And then eventually you've got all of these like sections of knitting and then you attach it all again and, and knit all the way around. Um, it's not my favorite in terms of a, a buttonhole technique by any stretch. But to get that big enough buttonhole, that's kind of what you need to do. So um, overall, I'm really, really, really happy with how this turned out. It's obviously just an, a, a huge sweater and a huge undertaking. Um, just a huge amount of knitting and um, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of time. Um, but it turned out really, really well. I'm I'm happy with it. The Patagonia Organic Merino by Juniper Moon Farms is the yarn that I used. Um, I used the sand colorway and the smoked colorway. And you guys will not believe it, but of that yarn, of those skeins of yarn, I ended up only using one of the sand and two of the smoked. Um, so I've ended up being left over literally with half of the yarn that I had bought for it. So. I had four, the pattern called for yardage for four, that I would need four, um, uh, four of the main color and two of the contrast color. And I literally used half of that. So this is all I have left over from the second skein of the smoked colorway, but I have two more skeins left over and I have one full skein of the sand colorway. Um, these skeins are 382 yards. But the pattern calls for a huge amount of yarn um, compared to what I actually used. I did make the smallest size, but the smallest size um, is a 38 inch bust. Um, so you're, uh, because you're supposed to knit it with quite a bit of ease, positive ease. So this is, um, um, yeah, it's the small, it's the size small, but it's a 30, 37, 38 inch bust. Uh, and then to finish, you pick up, along the outside here and do your ribbing and cast off. Um, and you do some decreasing underneath in the armhole here, um, just for, to kind of cinch it in a little bit. And I did change the, um, I did change a couple of things. I'll just speak to them really, really quickly. Um, because I am cognizant of the time. So one of the things that I changed was in here, See if you guys can, I'll just lift the camera up a little bit so that I can get up and over and you guys can really see. So in here, um, I did short row shaping to lift up the back neck a little bit. And then I did a three needle bind off. So this is a three needle bind off. And then um, I, I put it sewed in the end. So, and I did the same on the other side, just to lift up the back neck a little bit and just give it a little bit more shaping and a little bit more fit. Um, and then instead of uh, casting off these stitches, I left them live and just pick them up to, to keep on going with, with the ribbing up the back neck. And then I found this scarf in my scarf drawer and it's like the perfect match. <laughs> so now I have a scarf to wear with it, which is perfect. So um, I was happy with how the, the lifting up went. Um, there's one stitch all the way along that is the, um, like meant to be the, the selvage. If I were to do this again, which it would have to be, uh, I'm not sure I'll ever knit this again, but um, <laughs> it was very intense. Um, I think I would do two selvage stitches so that I would have two stockinette stitches all the way up that I would have a really nice clean line uh, to lift up because it wouldn't make any difference to the mosaic patterning but you would have a much cleaner uh, pickup line if, if, I, if I had that space. So um, that is the, that is it. It's done. It's hard to believe it's done, but it's done. So yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I went through my Vogue searching for that pattern. I have every other anniversary, special anniversary issue. Oh no. Um, 
I haven't posted a picture with it on yet, um, Judy, but I will this week. I will this week, I promise. Because, uh, yeah, it's on my list of things to do. Actually, it's a gorgeous day outside. We've got gorgeous sun shining through. Hopefully, I'll be able to get that done today. Especially because my hair is done because of the podcast. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the knitting is pretty intense. It is, it is a very, very intense knit. But it was worth it. It was worth it. So, yeah. So thank you, you guys. So let's go into community participation. Let me share with you what our community is working on. For December, I wanted you guys to tell us about your holiday plans since this is kind of an odd year. So you can either comment uh, in the episode thread on Ravelry, which is linked in the live chat, or you can comment here on YouTube on this particular episode. You can go ahead and do that. Um, the giveaway this month is an invitation to one of our queries and explorations meetings, uh, which uh, will be in, you, you will be invited to join one in January, which happened twice a month after the live stream. Um, so we had one last weekend and then we've got one coming up um, next weekend. So if you uh, are curious about some of that stuff, please go ahead and, and uh, uh, make a comment. Tell us what you're doing for your holiday plans. You will be absolutely um Welcome to join us. For November, Sarah won the Emotional Project. So Sarah is invited to join us on one of the Queries and Explorations groups as well. So Sarah, I will get in touch with you to coordinate about that. Um, she says, okay, I'll, um, the random number generator chose um, her comment, which she happened to be the first one that had commented. So she says, okay, I'll go first. Mine isn't an emotional yarn, but an emotional knit. Some years ago in 2016, I knit a mohair shawl. It doesn't have a project page on Ravelry. I'm not even sure I still have photos. It was knit in the same teal mohair that she used for her sister's sweater this year. That was the one that I had shared with you guys that was the Tin Can Knits um, love note for her sister. The reason it was emotional is because it's what I would take with me to knit at the hospital when I was visiting my dad and he died that year. Anyway, not to put too much of a downer on this, I found that the act of finishing the shawl and then gifting it to a good friend was very cathartic and I was very grateful for the act of knitting. Thank you, Sarah. That is why we make. That is why we knit. That is why we spin. It's all, it's that you just summed it up beautifully. And I'm sorry to hear about your dad. I know what that's like. And I, um, it's not easy. So Kaylee, we're going to talk about breed and color study. We are finishing up our Charhole study at the end of this month, and then we'll be starting our next study in January. Um, and Kaylee has finished up her breed and color study. So she started with two bats and she ended up with 355 yards of two ply. Um, she suspects it's about worsted weight ish and she enjoyed spinning it more than she expected. She thinks that she'll use the warm colors together and the cool colors together in separate projects. She tried to keep the light colors together with a little blending where they changed. It's not terribly consistent, but she suspects it will be fine once it knits up. You're absolutely right, Kaylee. It will be. Uh, we had a really interesting conversation last weekend in queries and explorations about breed and color study and the purpose of breed and color study. Um, I think it was really illuminating for people and um, it was a really positive conversation. So if you have already listened to uh, Wool and Spinning Radio, if you're a patron of the show, if you have already listened to the Wool and Spinning episode for December, um, but you didn't catch the end of the podcast because I edited it. So at, at a roughly 27 minutes to the end, there's the I've included the edited audio conversation that was had in Queries and Explorations. And I really recommend that you guys go back and listen to that if you missed that. Um, if you haven't, or if you haven't listened to the episode yet, please go ahead and listen to Woolen Spinning Radio for December. Because the conversation that we had in Queries and Explorations was, it was really illuminating. Um, and I, I hope that it was helpful. Um, about breed and color study, the purpose of breed and color study, why we do breed and color study. So um, yeah, please have a listen if, if you haven't. So thank you, Kaylee, for sharing. This is from Greta. I love these mittens. She's finished her breed and color study as well. Um, they are one crazy party, she says. Uh, breed and color study mitts. She took the bat, stripped it down into lengths of color, arranging the plies on the floor to mimic what the finished three ply would transition like. In the knitting, it's not exactly a matchup since some colors run longer than others. Ultimately, she didn't want the dark red next to the dark green, and that worked. Her favorite section was two pink plies matched with one line. 
The mitts are a pattern called Ghostwood and they are dense, sturdy, and well fitted for my small hands, she says. In the end, it was fun to see how the color moved and I love the fabric. The colors are more busy than she imagined and perhaps next time she blend them with a bit, blend them a bit between the color changes so to make it less stark, but they are fun and feel like they will last a good long time. Those are beautiful. Love those. Thank you for sharing, uh, Greta. And Alicia popped this into the Slack channel last night or yesterday. She is so proud. And actually, Alicia is local to me and me and Diana and, and uh, Glenda and a few of us who live here on the West Coast. She's in, um, um, oh, shoot. It's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, we used to go down there all the time. Uh, it's just in Washington. I'm so proud of finishing up the Breeden Co Woodby Island. Um, my, I'm so proud of finishing up the Breeden Color Study. My first time doing it. I got the fiber back in August and finished spinning it at the beginning of September. She really enjoyed spinning it from the bat. She pulled the colors apart and tried to decide how she wanted to spin it. She knew she really enjoyed how the color how the colorway looked in, originally, so she decided to go that route. She really enjoyed chain plying, so she went with that, and she's most comfortable with that. Uh, she thinks next time she would try to think outside the box and do something that she's not so comfortable with. Uh, being that this was my first breeding color study, I really didn't want to mess it up. The yarn turned out squishy and springy, which I surprisingly liked the feel of. I then lost interest in spinning and knitting, and it took me until December to finally get back into it. I really enjoy this knitting pattern I used and I think it went really well with the yarn. The bobbles and the lace work to me and it really amplifies the yarn and fiber. The pattern is the Together Hat by Deb Milstein of Late Night Knits. Beautiful, Alicia. Thank you so much for sharing. Alicia is a newer spinner and uh, it's just really great to see people gaining confidence and just really jumping in and trying things. Uh, we will start the next breed and color study, Martha, halfway through January. So it will, the Woolen Spinning Radio episode that introduces it will be released around January 15th and um, the dates will be shortly after, usually around the 20th of the month, whatever, it's usually whatever the Monday is of the third week of the month. So it'll probably be around the 18th or even maybe the 25th. So, yeah. So we've got some hand spun knitting to share. This is from Megan. Um, these are leg warmers to wear under her skirt when she walks to work this winter. The blue is blacker yarn Scotland. The rest is her own hand spun. Uh, the gray is natural Gotland that she carded from a fleece. The red is Gotland roving that she spindle spun this summer while hiking with her kids. And the brown is hand, the brown is hand spun Shetland and the white is hand spun alpaca. Aren't those beautiful? And I like that they're an ode to natural shades too. This would work really well for natural shades because the blue and the red is dyed, but the rest of it is natural shades, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely, definitely watch out for the next breed and color study. Um, the, uh, everything will start to be released at the beginning of January. So there'll be a lot of, there'll be like Patreon posts. It'll be in the newsletter. It will be on Woolen Spinning Radio. So make sure that you're uh, keeping, keeping up with, with that stuff. There'll kind of be like a, like a blast, if you will, of, of stuff coming up. This is from Kat Kokori. Um, she shares, she finished the, ex the quote, experimental merino bamboo socks. She's still not sold on this blend for socks. Me neither, Kat, me neither. But I'm pleased how they came out. And if nothing else, it gave me an opportunity to spin an opposing three ply, which she thinks from now on will feature regularly in her uh, sock spinning. One of the toes is knit from chain plied leftovers. She didn't pay attention when knitting the first sock and knit past her halfway point in the ball. So she had to improvise. Beautiful, you can't tell. Gorgeous. Actually, I have to admit, as much as the three ply, the opposing three ply didn't last under the belt sander in the article in Ply Magazine uh, in the sock issue, uh, I still really love opposing three ply. My opposing three ply socks have actually lasted quite well. The other ones that have lasted quite well, and I put them through the washing machine, I don't put them in the dryer, but I do put them in the washer, is my socks that were the Superwash BFL mixed 50 50 with the vegan uh, cashmere, the microfiber. They actually have lasted really, really well. I was wearing them this past week and threw them in the wash and they just, they just keep going. <laughs> so I have to say one point for those. Finally, we have my friend Mari. Um, this is a bat she purchased and spun as a chain ply to preserve the gradient knit into a twisted 
rib toque, which she decided she liked the look of with the twisted rib stitches on the inside after all of that. So she had literally flipped it inside out. She's gonna wear it for the next few days and decide if she wants to re-knit it as a regular rib to make it a bit roomier. So she decided that it was too small and she frogged it and will re-knit it after the holiday knitting is complete. And she has enough leftovers to make Elsie a neon toque for next winter, which is really cool. Elsie's her uh, almost one year old. <clears throat> oh, bless me all of this fiber and my nose is getting to me. I wanted to share this though, because even though Mari uh, had ripped it, those colors are unbelievable. They are so bright. Uh, even the camera was blowing out a little bit when she took the photo, which is unbelievable. So thank you so much everyone for sharing your projects and for continuing to post photos and to encourage one another. Um, I've really noticed that over the last couple of weeks, the Slack channel has been incredibly busy and people have been sharing a lot of their making. I think some of us are kind of still having to spend a lot of time at home. And so we're just, people are really sharing a lot. So thank you so much. And thank you for being so supportive of one another. If you're new to the Slack channel and you're just kind of dipping your toes in and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, make sure that you go to the intros channel. It's hashtag intros. There's a plus button on the left hand side, whether you're in browser or mobile mode, and you can see all of the channels there and go to the intros. And just even if you're a little bit shy and just want to just put a little bit of something about yourself, you know, your first name, where you're from, how long you've been spinning for, whether you knit or weave or crochet. And, um, you know, it just gets the conversation going and it kind of helps you to dip your toes in. And then in the hashtag general channel, that's where we share everything sort of hand spinning related. Random, the hashtag random channel is for sort of those thoughts and things that happen in our lives or the things that we come across on the internet that we want to share or random things that happen to us that we want to share with the community. And it's a really fun thread because it kind of helps us to get to know one another a little bit. So we try to keep the uh, spinning out of that thread. And uh, a lot of people will post their knitting in that thread that's commercial yarn, which is really helpful to keep it out of the general channel. So yeah, just jump in and um, you'll find that you'll make friends very quickly. This coming Thursday on the 17th, we have our second Maker Morning coming up. So our first one was last Thursday, a week and a bit ago. It went really, really well. Thank you so much to everybody who joined. It was a lot of fun getting to know where everybody was. We just did a check-in. And if you're curious about joining that and curious about being around for that, um, you just need to check your messages on uh, Patreon. And I sent it out to everybody who is in the coffee circle and, and up. Um, so everybody was, was welcome to join and we got a really good turnout, which is really fun. So I think people are getting really comfortable and really kind of get how to use zoom now and, and, you know, to keep your mute, your mic muted when there's a lot of background noise and turning things on and off and screen sharing, like everybody just kind of gets it now. And so it went really, really well. So thank you to everybody who came. It was lovely to put some personalities to names. Um, over time, I think we get a really good sense of who we all are and, um, you know, sort of what our personalities are like based on the way that we respond to things and the way that we chat to one another online. But the, you don't get that personality. You know, you guys see me, but I don't see you necessarily unless you have your own podcast or something. So, um, yeah, just, just, uh, it, it was really nice to kind of get to know people and to get to see them. So if you have questions about how to use the Slack channel, you think that you maybe have access via Patreon, then ju you just need to reach out to me and, and we'll get you set up. Um, so that is for those who are curious about the Slack channel, um, you just need to be pledging at the $5, um, which is the, what's that level called? I can never remember what the different levels are called. Isn't that terrible? There's the coffee circle and then there's the spinning circle. So you need to be in the spinning circle or higher um, to be in the Slack channel. And if you haven't received an invite and you think that you should have, just send me a note um, and we can have a conversation. And again, uh, the community is so super stinking helpful. So if you're really having, if you're struggling and you know you're on there, as long as you can get to where you need to type a message, people will help you. So just ask. It's all good. Um, until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, everyone. I hope that you're doing really super well wherever you are and celebrating whatever holiday is meaningful for you and whatever this time of year brings for you. And um, we're here 
and making and doing our things. So please don't hesitate to jump in and, and join us. And these maker mornings, if they if they really resonate with you guys and you want to keep doing them, it's definitely something that we can work towards as a, our next goal for the community. Since in-person retreats are not really a thing right now, um, this is definitely something that we can we can work towards. So tell your friends and jump in. Until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy dreaming. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you.